There's a universe inside each of us. The Universe Podcast is your portal to that infinite realm of ideas. I'm Chance Garten, and I'll be your host as we serve up inspirational sound waves from the brightest minds with the highest vibes. And we keep searching for the empowering perspectives we need to create our greatest masterpiece of all, our lives. Welcome to the one within all to the Interverse. I'm your happy host, Chance, and this recording is coming to you from the 18th of August, 2019, as we enter the last month of summer. I hope you all have enjoyed the sun and made time to play outside, explore the nature around you from close and afar. And if you're like me, go to a few festivals too. I know that for all too many of us since finishing school especially, summer means little more than a hotter workday and a longing for lakes and oceans while we toil indoors for dollar bills. But ever since I discovered the joy of music festivals, I get excited each year to reconnect with communities of friends from all over. So spread the fairy dust and sing for joy because today is a blessed day indeed as we're reunited with a beautiful soul who has a burning passion for bringing folks out of the murky malaise of modernity and into the bright beneficence of a magical mentality. And as the chief workshop director for Backwoods Music Festival at Mulberry Mountain, she was responsible for making many such mystical moments for attendees there earlier this year. Our guest today is Aubrey Warren, a yoga instructor and all around inspirational, emboldening and authentic free spirit who is returning to Interverse for a second time this year or a third, depending on how you count it, because she sat in and spoke words of wisdom with me at the live podcast I did at Backwoods this year and also even arranged for it to happen. So for all this and more, I'm crazy grateful, as can be, to bring her back to the show for you. Connect with her at AubreyWarren.com and get inspired with Aubrey Warren on Facebook. Show her some love on social media for me. And if you're an event or festival coordinator, you might just want to invite her to your shindig so she can show your crew how much yoga can improve your party plasticity and elevate your dance endurance. So let's do this thing, y'all. I've been looking forward to it for many weeks now. So please join me in opening up your hearts to welcome the festival fairy goddess mother, yoga rock star and champion of feminine empowerment, Aubrey Warren, back to the show. Thanks for being here, Aubrey, and welcome to the Interverse. Oh, thank you for having me, Chance. I always love your beautiful spin with words. I'm really, really enjoying researching etymologies of words right now. So hearing the way you uh, architect language together is always such a titillating experience for me. So thank you for never disappointing. (laughs) Uh, You give me too much credit because I could definitely spend more time writing and developing that muscle. And in fact, I kind of feel like I just have one strategy, which is try to get alliteration. And then in doing it, it just kind of like compounds some interesting words together and it all sounds cool. But I guess that's how most people feel about their craft. They're like, ah, it was just the only way I knew how to do it. It's not special. But to others, everything that someone else does is a unique expression. So it's it's cool to be recognized. And I would like to recognize you for your extremely unique perspective and expression on the world. And especially excited to hear that you've been starting up writing on a new book, not not new for you in terms of starting it, but getting back into the swing of it. You want to tell us about that as we kick things off here? Oh yeah, sure. Okay. So, you know, about, about, I would say a decade, no, it's been longer than a decade ago. Um, I started writing a book probably before I started having children. Actually, that's a lie. I started writing a book when I was in elementary school, um, but I didn't have, you know, when you like feel like there's something you're supposed to do, but you don't have all the tools to do it yet. Like I started writing a book in elementary school, but it was like, there wasn't a story there and I kept trying to make shit up and it never worked. And, and, and as life progressed, I really started, I mean, everybody, everybody has a story to tell. Everybody's life experience is, is valuable and interesting. And, um, I just happen to really, really enjoy putting pen to paper and enjoy uh, giving expression to, I love words and I love, um, I love storytelling. And so I started with that process years ago. And to be honest with you, uh, it, it really started to take shape 
about 12, 13 years ago when I had my first miscarriage. And my husband wanted to have babies before I did. And I, we tried to get pregnant for a really long time, at least in, in the perspective we were looking at, like a year. And after a year of trying, got pregnant and lost the baby. And I was in the deepest depression I had ever been in at that point. And a woman who I consider a spiritual mother of mine, when I was spending time with her, asked me, if I would have met you prepubescent, what would you have said you like to do? And I said that I like to, um, I like to sing and I like to dance and I like to do anything artistic, but I never drew or painted or anything. And she went and she handed me this book and it's called The Artist's Way. And The Artist's Way is a book. Have you heard of The Artist's Way? No, I just got excited because that sounds like a great book. <laughs> oh, it's an amazing book. And so the ba the book was written in essence for, for someone who has artist block. But at the beginning of the book, it talks about how we're all made in, uh, we're all made in, in the form of our ultimate creator to be creative. And so in essence, we're all here to be creative beings and that uh, your creativity is in essence um, a part of your spiritual path. And if you spend time really diving into your creativity, different parts of you will start to unlock and start to come forth. And, and so uh, how this book is broken down is it's uh, 12 chapters and you're supposed to do it we, one chapter at a time where it gives like a, a spiritual lesson. And then you spend 30 minutes every morning doing morning pages, just like just writing, 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 writing. And then once a week going on an artist date with yourself where you just do something for two hours creative, no matter what it is. And chance that book changed my life. Because I looked at it as a form of therapy and I took it very seriously. And I was in an extremely dark depression when I started that. And by the end, I wasn't anymore. And so I recognized in that moment the healing capacity of art. And I, so I really started to write right then at that point. But then I became a mom. Then all my life's dreams and hopes came true. I became a mom. And... I lost myself. Well, it's almost like the creative energy once unblocked came out in full force in the form of like kids and everything, which is the ultimate expression of what we can create. Since you create another human, you basically just created an entirely extra infinity. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, I really lost myself in motherhood and I got sidetracked by some things and really put my writing to, side, to, the, to the side for a while. And... Um, but I recognize now it was because what I thought was the end of the story wasn't the end of the story. Um, and what was the end of the story? Well, it was basically I, what I thought was a distraction was really the universe's opportunity to just create some space and be like, you have some life to live before the story actually isn't done yet. So you have some life to live before you can, before it will completely take its shape. And what's really been interesting is, uh, the shit that I've really been passionate about lately, which we'll get to in just a second, um, is the work that I was supposed to be doing of the message that was needing to come forth through the book. And, and so it was like, I was doing all this work, all this work, all this work, all this work. And then a moment in time happened where I hosted my first retreat. So I'm, and which we're going to talk about here in a second anyway. And in the final like fire ceremony of the retreat, like I got a download of the entire rest of the fucking book. And so Spirit, who used to keep me up at night telling me that I needed to tell this story, she went dormant for a while, but she just started waking me up and keeping me up again. I think before this podcast, Chance, I was telling you I'm not sleeping right now. It's because it's, it's Spirit telling me I'm supposed to get my ass up and I'm supposed to be writing in the wee hours of the morning now instead of sleeping is what's happening. So I'm writing and the name of the book is it's called Sex, Drugs and Yoga, A Modern Witch Rem Remembering Herself. And before when I was writing the book, it was called Sex, Drugs, and Yoga, 
a modern age yogini finding her way. Um, but but what this fire ceremony reminded me was that um, actually yoga is one of my tools. I'm not, I don't necessarily claim myself as a yogi anymore. I'm claiming myself as a modern natural witch. Wow. <laughs> and there's probably quite a bit more to unpack about deciding that type of identification for yourself, which is also really important to reclaim right now and take it out of the shadows and not that you shouldn't dance around at night, <laughs> but that there's so still problematic associations with the terminology and even some that play into that by sort of over gothing it, if you will, with the whole witchiness, <laughs> or even there are some types of uh, magic that you could consider harmful, especially uh, that in the past was associated with the, the type of witchcraft that our forefathers would have been worried about. So updating the definition of what it means to be a magical lady in the world is important. And it sounds good. Yeah. Well, and you know, my, my, one of my teachers who is a tantric Kundalini master, um, which I very much is a part of my lineage and I'm part, part of my practice. Um, he says that R Ravana does the same chants and the same mantras as Shiva. Ravana is a demon, is a yogi demon, okay, within Hindu mythology. And so Shiva, who's like one of the main gods and Ravana do the same mantras. The only thing that's different is their intention behind them and their intentions for usage behind them. So, you know, a lot of times, I mean, the people who you feel like are the most horrible in this world are actually an extremely powerful enlightened souls it's just that they have uh, they have a selfish egoic intended intention behind the use of their power and their magic instead of pure you know just so it, it's with everything but can i share with you the etymology of the word witch which is like blowing my mind Please. Yeah, I don't think I know that. That sounds good. I'm so happy okay. that you're getting into etymology. I think I've been intending to explore it more on the show. And so thank you for bringing it in as intended without me having to actually go out of my way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. OK, so first I'm going to pause here and sh share with you the word which has been following my whole life, following me my whole life. But it's always been something I've been fucking scared of. OK, so like starting with like, you know, The Wizard of Oz was my favorite movie in this world. Right. At the, whenever I was a little kid and little things have happened throughout my life where there would be women who would consider themselves a witch. And I would have this, this, this root of like fear that I would notice pop up inside me. But then as I would lean in and get to know these women, I would discover that, oh my gosh, these are like really amazing people. Why am I so afraid of this word? Right? So the word witch is actually stems from, from is a Germanic word which was in English, which stems from German, which German is actually a Sanskrit word. So the word witch, W-I-T, was from the, so it was vit, came from the word, actually vid, when you, when you, um, when you translated it to Sanskrit, was vid, V-I-D. So W-I-T, when you take it back to Sanskrit, was W-I-D, vid, vid, vidya, are you veda? The, the Vedas. It means truth. It means greatest truth. So when, when you took it back to ancient times, the witches, the, vid, the vidyas, the witches were, <laughs> it sounds kind of, were, were the truth holders were the healers, were the midwives, were the women in the culture in, in that, in that, who are the high priestesses, the ones who are gathering the knowledge of the alchemy of the spirit, the alchemy of the herbs and the fruits and the oils of how to blend them all together to bring relief to our human experience. Because before modern medicine, before science of what we see today, everything was magic. Right. Everything that we now consider science was once considered magic. So think about this. What is the most magical thing on our planet? The vagina. Did I get it right? Pretty damn close. It's the womb. It's the I female that, body. I say it because it's the portal, the only way that you can get into this place. It's the only right. way in. It's like, and you're bringing forth a magical being. So 
and it's an infinite magical being that could even create more of itself. So I feel like that portal in the body has got to be the most radically magical thing. And so, yeah, the womb, definitely. That's also what I mean there. Pretty yeah. crazy. So the, the female body can bleed seven days and not die. If that's not fucking magical, I don't know what is. And we can bleed for seven days and not die. And we can create life. So back in, and, and, and let's be clear, back in ancient times, everything that happened with women in regards to our bodies all happened in the red tent. Men didn't know shit about what was happening because during all, before we had modern medicine and before we had hormones in our food, all of women bled with the dark moon. So right before the dark moon, because all of our bodies were in sync with nature, we would all go into the red tent once we became a woman. And the, the women who were still of bleeding age would, would rest and would allow our bodies to do what they needed to do. The crones and the witches of the community would gather and they would massage them and they would put the oils on them and they would do all of the things to do to nurture and honor the female, the woman's bodies. And so when all of these things were going on to take care of the women, the men were out there. They had no idea what was going on. So when the evolution of modern medicine started to happen, the first doctors were men. Nobody knew what the fuck was going on with the women's bodies. And so our bodies became something that needed to be cleaned up, plugged up, and and, and made not to be such a problem or such a, such a thing anymore because the red tint in that culture just started to dissipate with the evolution of the monotheism and so on that we have today. All of the magic was stripped away because what we didn't understand, we feared. In a fractal sense, there's a deep ex explanation here too that if you look at everything as Shakti and Shiva or the yin and the yang, then the body itself is symbolic of the earth. But the female body is m more symbolic of the earth because it is also a womb matrix of creation, just like the entire planet is on a fractal scale. So giving the time of rest and honoring and healing of the bodies of the women is akin to in a gardening practice, doing what needs to be done during the winter to ensure that in the spring, the the new season brings life and fertility and abundance. So they were literally doing earth magic to propagate their own abundance as a tribe in every way. And on the entire planet, the more humans are in this relationship with the female body. So losing that is actually huge. And then I'll also say it's good for the men as well, because men seem to have, at least from my perspective, men seem to have a desire to be away from the women for roughly a week out of the month total, you know? Yeah. And yeah. so all around, it's it's good for the whole cycle. And it's like symbolic of the seasons because there's generally uh, four weeks between new moons. So, you know, that explains the 13 moon calendar as well, which we've talked about at length on the show. There's so much that ties in here. It's <laughs> really important that we take note of the fractal tie here between all the things that we're talking about and what the fall really is when it comes to where we're at now and our disempowerment as beings relative to our infinite potential. Absolutely. And that, that's really the work that I'm doing right now is studying of the cycles. And because when you say the seasons, the seasons, I mean, I, have, I mean, a, a woman, because what you just said right now is in regards to um, a, a woman's body is symbolic of mother nature. So within yogic, within yogic philosophy, the male is represented by this as the seed and the woman is rep represented as the creation of the manifestation of that intention. Or like the spirit and the spirit and matter being female being the matter and male being the spirit because the spirit enters into the matter of the body. And in a way, that's symbolic of insemination itself, the way that your body houses your spirit and actually grows it like a womb. And part of why we're here is to grow in our bodies as soul seeds, if you will. 
Right. And so, so in, in essence, whenever you look at say sacred geometry, uh, and I don't know much about sacred geometry, but this is just what's flowing through. So we'll see, we're going to go with it. it. I mean, male is linear. Okay. Female is, is cyclical. Okay. So male is straight sh- women come in, come in circles. And so in regards to the female psyche is concerned and the female body well, let's just say for a second, for this female psyche, we, I mean, the female body, we go in, we go in cycles. So our winter, when we are bleeding is when we're bleeding and our spring is when we're just on the other side, you know? So basically all of the stages of the female body is represented within the seasons on a monthly scale. It's also represented within a life cycle. So we have, we have spring, which is the maiden before she has her first period. We have the mother, right? When she has her first period, we have the queen after she has have established that, that stage of her life for a certain period of time. And then we have the crone when she stopped bleeding. The thing though, that's the important part for for my message right now, I think chance is that I really want to get through, um, because I could talk about this shit for hours. So let me screw into the, to the way in which that I, what I'm really passionate about right now is that once all of so let's go back to these ancient times where we have, we had the God and the goddess. We had, we had the magic, the, the, the witches, and we had the magic of the female body and we had all of this. And then all of a sudden we came in, this representation of the mother, this representation of the woman and all of these faces were stripped away to now we have, now we have the virgin and now we have the whore. Those are the two examples of the female face that we have as a woman. And And in Christian theology, they're not even part of the Trinity. They're taken out entirely and it's replaced by a Holy ghost, which I think is just like a big joke by the architects of control that poof the, uh, the goddess has gone up in a puff of smoke and now it's just a a ghost, right? Right, right. So, so we were given with these two, two archetypes, which aren't holy at all within, within the theisms that we have today. And then we were also told that our cycles needed to be, that now all of a sudden we weren't even honoring or acknowledging the cycle of the woman in regards to being something magical. Now it's something that needs to be cleaned up and taken care of. And we need to use morning, summer's eve to take away the smell and all of the things that we've been told are gross about what our body bodies are now. Do you know how much that fucks up the woman's head? That to be told that she is has she, there's nothing holy about her and she's really is she only serves these two roles in life and the things that are the most natural about her are the things that need to be fixed. And so that that fucks up with a woman's head and and because of the Catholic Church making the burning of witches legal, it turned women against each other. So there, there is this subconscious competition between women, and there is this subconscious rage that we have of being pushed aside. And so where I am today, Chance, is wanting to empower women with the, the knowledge of their cycles, because We can use our cycles as a means to claim our weekly superpowers if we know what's going on inside of our bodies and know hormonally what's going on and how we can like jump on that frequency and write it instead of push it down and push it away. Okay. So if we learn how to get on those, on those waves and ride them, we can be more productive in our lives, but it's not just about riding the wave for me. It's about learning how to tame, not tame our rage. You mentioned that thing about there's about a week out of the month that men don't want to be around their women. You made that comment. Well, yeah, but I wouldn't necessarily want to say that it's associated with um, attitude changes or shifts because I feel like in terms of how people react on their cycle, it has probably more to do with their general health. Um psychologically and physically than just being on a cycle. And some people are almost unnoticeably 
it, you know, the same person at any point of the cycle. That could also be part of sort of the monotone overthrow of the cycles themselves in a sense, or maybe in a case of a female who has a shorter window of time than seven days, you could be looking at an over imbalance of uh, yang energy or masculine energy possibly. But all, all said and done, uh, men being the linear are also sort of the dividers and the category creators of categories and, and all that. And I think just for the sake alone of the role of the yang energy or the Shiva force, they seek a point of isolation uh, in a lot of cases. A lot of men do. I personally, it, it seems to kind of come automatically most of the time that at that certain amount of time of the month, um, not in tune with cycles, but a, a certain amount of time of the month, I have a personal cycle of wanting to uh, like withdraw or explore, but uh, alone, I guess. I want to say one more thing for the guys too. I think even though we're talking a lot about female stuff overall, it's important for us to be getting exposed to this type of thing. I wasn't even taught what the female cycle was as a kid at any point in health class or in school. My health teacher in elementary school just told stories about how cool he was in high school and just hung out. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. So it's important that we not desensitize ourselves to it because that's actually what we have been doing by pushing it away and hiding it, but just uh, acknowledge the, that there is magic in this cycle and get rid of or start working as hard as you can to get rid of the notion of anything being gross about anything that is natural that the human body does for certain. Well, you know, Chance, two things, really. I think one of you feeling that natural pull away, I think my part of that might be actually because you're, I mean, maybe all guys feel that. I don't know. But you're also a highly conscious, empathic man. And um, so during the during days 20 uh during days 22 through 28 of women's cycle which in the in the plus version i'm going to go ahead and just to 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 tease this in the plus version i'm going to share all the details of what i call embodied time management where i will share you specifically of what the what your monthly or what your weekly superpowers are as a woman to be able to maximize your awesomeness throughout the month and which will be greatly beneficial for men to know too because if you know where your woman is in your cycle in her cycle you can know what's normal what to expect and so on because it is cyclical and happens every month but so i think one of them might be that is because you as a as an empathic man might pick up on that your woman needs that space because that's when the veil of illusion is the thinnest in the woman's psyche, where her body is screaming at her to go inward because the universe has messages in, to share with her. That's when the women of the red tent would go into their tent to be able to get downloads and inspirations and so on. So you might be feeling a, a partially empathic with your partner to give her space because she needs this to grow. Or maybe it's your own experience as well. I'm not for sure. Or even events that just align synchronistically to bring it about, you know, it, it seems like the rhythm is built into the whole system. Well, and if, if you're in tune with it, then it takes a lot of decision-making out sometimes, not that you can't plan for them for things and uh, prepare for things like you're teasing in the plus extension. And thank you for bringing us that information. It's pretty rare to get plus exclusive uh, content like that. So thank you. But yeah, in general, I think that Beginning to recognize the cycles and honor them mentally can bring about, if you are willing to make choices and changes as they're given to you opportunistically, a uh, better alignment at the flow of cycles generally without as much effort as it might seem like at first. And then you can, you can layer on more effort of preparation and planning and forethought into these cycles and seasons as you continue to just explore and learn about them. 
but knowledge is power. Knowing is half the battle. That's what G.I. Joe says. Oh, and that's the point. And so for me, that's the reason why I started studying these cycles is because, so I shared in our first discussion about backwoods when I shared some stories about mine and Jacob's um, uh, commitment to uh, commitment to music festival life and our experience with MDMA and how it's been so healing in regards to our relationship. So guys, I've been married to the same dude for 16 years. We've been living together for 17 and a half years. We've been a partnership for 18 years. That's a long fucking time. You don't hear people doing that very very often anymore these days. And I come from a home where as it, um, my parents are still in love. My parents are, st- I, I come from an extremely amazing home and household. And I recognize the gift that is to a child. I can't begin to describe the safety and security that that gave me in a human as a human in my development and maturation process because I felt so supported in my home. And that is my highest and my, my, that is my number one priority in my life is to give my children the same sense of safety and security that I was gifted as a child. And I recognize that that marriage takes work and and getting to 16 years of being with the same person in the same marriage hasn't been easy it's been fucking hard honestly and i just happen to be one of those women where every month at a certain time my hormones would be at a particular point but i wasn't conscious of where it went, where i was in my cycle and because i'm a people pleaser I would have all of this stress come up that I bottle, 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 bottle. And then because there's a certain point in the female cycle where our hormones are at their absolute low, that I would have one tiny little stressor happen and then the top would come off and all the stress that I've been bottling all month would come out at a jab at something really mean, whether it be, whether it be, um, straight or passive aggressive that I would jab at my husband. And if you do that every month for 16 fucking years, some damage happens. And one of my, one of my teachers tells you it's rarely what's happening outside of you. That is the problem that most people in your life or a mirror. And when things piss you off, it's usually not something in that person out there that needs to be fixed. It's something within yourself that needs to be fixed. And so every month when I would, I would say something that would be hurtful to my husband. And then I would have to spend three days, maybe a week at the most, it's been two weeks cleaning up my mess that I made wondering if he was going to forgive me this time. So frustrated, asking myself every month, what's fucking wrong with me? Why am I so crazy? Why can't I get my shit together? Like thinking, you know, it's like, I thought that I was going crazy. And so it was through the asking of those questions that led me to the work that I am right now in the female cycle. It was the recognizing is if I could actually be conscious of what was going on in my body. And I could know, you know, every month about this time, this is the day that I'm going to say something that's going to be really hurtful. Then what that mindful, what we learn in mindfulness is it's the space in between the trigger and the response. That's important. So if you know that there's going to be a trigger on this day, You can be mentally prepared for it to create the space to make a new choice. I think that applies for all of us, too, because even outside of cycles, especially for those of us who maybe didn't have as balanced and uh, secure of a childhood like you described. I mean, that's a big issue for many. I mean, some come through it's all the stronger. And at the end of the day, 
your childhood isn't as important as your choices, but there's traumas for most people in modern culture that can be triggered from one thing or another and almost all revolving around self-image, which is especially under assault for women and has been for quite some time, but also for men as well. And frankly, men suffer some things that women don't as, that are atrocious all on their own that deserve an entire exploration just to make sure that you know not to ever advocate for it, like circumcision, which is a uh, bane to many, uh, many men later in their life where they realize, man, I would have never signed up for this. When did I sign this social contract that says you're going to maim me? And thus I have two sons who are both have their foreskin. <laughs> well, th that's good. I mean, if there's one thing that we can do this generation, breaking that evil tradition would be worthwhile, I think. But that's a whole nother subject. My point is just that we all have trip wires out there and we don't even usually realize what set the tripwire there. And it's typically stuff that goes all the way back to what I'm just now talking about as far as creating our problems with self-image that give us the frustration and the lashing out at others or judging others when really they're just vibing off of the bad mood we're in. And until we choose to flip it around, it's not going to because we each create our own personal reality. It's parallel universe all the way across from person to person. <laughs> and you get to choose the whole vibe of things all the time. Absolutely. You know, it, I mean, that, that it's always a choice. It's always a choice. And we all have cycles and we all, all can make those different decisions. And, you know, th this aspect of, of kind of coming back to, to the book was just an, um, it, it's an aspect and it's a part of the teaching that, um, I feel inspired to, that I insp feel inspired to share, but really chance what you were saying earlier about not everyone has the benefit of coming from such a, um, a, a good childhood. That's actually a big part of the work that I'm here, here to share too. And it's a big part of the book as well. Um, so, so the a, a statistic that like, just that is a driving force in, in what I'm doing right now is that 50% of all marriages end in divorce and 50% of all divorces are because the women are sexually unsatisfied and the men don't know what to do to please them. And and, and a lot of that has to do with, you know, within the evolution of modern medicine and the female body and the woman and the, and every, everything that what they, um, well, I'll, I'll just be blunt. It was about a hundred years ago that, they, that modern medicine even knew that a woman had a clitoris. Okay. And so, and, and so we have not been taught not only about our cycles, but not even about our full bodies. They still in school, in schools show the picture of a, of the female internal system that only includes her reproductive organs. That's what a girl is taught. A girl is taught that she isn't for making babies, but the bottom line is, is we wouldn't have been given a clitoris if we weren't supposed to enjoy sex too. Well, then that takes me, I just want to touch on the, the whole foreskin faux pas that culture has been continually perpetuating, that the sexual satisfaction of women has a lot to do with the way that the man does what he does. And that's actually drastically changed. It's been proven by removing the foreskin because there's a sensitive area there for the man that without it tends to make sex go into more rougher and... Um, Big, like, di different type of rhythm is what you could say, just for the man to feel as much or feel even a, he won't, he'll never know if he's going to feel even a portion of what it would be with the foreskin. But the point is having it there for lack of a less graphic description, it slides in such a way that is more pleasurable to the man while doing gentler motions, which the woman also tends to enjoy. And all around, it just, brings the uh, pleasure level up for the guy to have that. So both of us are in either mentally or physically cut off at a young age from even understanding that sex is more than just making babies, which uh, is what you're getting at. And I just thought I'd throw that in there that it's on both sides. It's pretty crazy. It is 
is crazy. And it's so sad of what our culture, of what the Western culture has has done to what is one of the most magical and beautiful and mystical acts on this planet, which is the union of two souls and bodies coming together. And, you know, an orgasm is the closest thing we can get to heaven on earth, you know, and uh, the, the shame that we put around it. But the, the sad thing is, Chance, the sad thing is, is 10% of women have never had an orgasm before. 10% of women have never had an orgasm before. And that stems to, we've been, treat, we've been taught that our bodies were dirty. We've been taught that if we, if we want to seek pleasure, we're a whore. And so we're not given the permission as young girls. We're, we're shamed as young girls in touching our bodies. And so therefore, then we're never, um, we never learn what pleases ourselves. And then we come together in partnership. And then we have this, this feeling of, well, if, if, if he loved me, then he would really know what, what pleased me. Well, that's bullshit. That's bullshit. And, and if we're never able to teach our men what pleases us, then how are they ever going to know? So right now, you know, I think it's, it's so important that, that we take away, we start talking more about the importance of pleasure in our lives, not only but for multiple reasons. One is because if a woman is sexually satisfied, then there's not going to be as many divorces. There's not going to be as many, there's not, there are more happy mothers mean more happy families. That's just the way it works. And it only takes 30 seconds of pleasure, whether you're eating a piece of chocolate, whether you, and really mindfully eating a piece of chocolate, not like gorging it, but mindfully eating a piece of chocolate. I mindfully really gorge on it. Right. Or like, or really coming together in union sensually and experiencing that pleasure. It takes 30 seconds for your brain to start releasing the chemical cocktails of serotonin, dopamine, and um, oxytocin in order. It, those are natural, like antidepressants. Right. If more people were just fucking having orgasms and coming in union with their partners on a regular basis, there's going to be less people on medic on, on medications these days, too. So I feel like I'm talking in circles because I, I get so passionate about all of this shit. But it's about pleasure. It's about knowing your cycle. And then it's about just like becoming conscious about like paying attention to that shit. And when we do, when we as women like in like prioritize our pleasure and then know where we are in our cycle, we're less likely to use our periods as an excuse to be mean. Oh, I like it. <laughs> and also, I think this all ties back into one of the things we kicked off talking about, which is the creative way, because I think that getting in touch with our creative way is something that naturally draws and brings into our life, the divine union and partnerships that you're talking about. And for those of us that haven't found that type of conscious relationship, the keys to that really are in creating the self that you would create if your life was an art project. So whatever, like you said, what, what that prepubescent version of you would really like to do, even if it doesn't become your main vocation or somehow pay your livelihood, get back in touch with what it was that you once loved. Like for me, it's reading and drawing. Those are two things that if I'm not doing those, at least sometimes I kind of start to fade. And even Partly why I wanted to return to this topic was just because <laughs> I just took a, a straight week off of doing much work on the podcast unplanned just because I got so engrossed in reading and felt like, oh, shit, I've got a creative block now because uh, I'm so obsessed with this distraction. The book was The Lord of the Rings. So it was a good week well spent. And I finished it today. But what's cool is that just getting back behind the mic and talking to you unlocks parts of my throat chakra, if you will, that um, I had been, I guess, resting, but it's all there. And you yourself are the tool that's needed, whether 
or not you feel up for it. Just doing your thing is going to be doing your thing. What's fun to you? What, what you can create, even if it's just doodles or even if it's just a journal, like having a disciplined practice of that is going to bring you out of being so distracted and hung up on yourself in a bad way. So why I circle back around to this is because I was wondering if you could share more about that time in your life where you came, pulled yourself out of depression with uh, that book and maybe what some of the tips are for that, uh, how, how to do that, I guess, as you recall it. Well, one of the main tips at first was, is was just was journaling every morning um, because we store so much in our psyche and we store so much in our mind that the, the main part of that book at first was just morning pages. You commit to journaling for 30 minutes every day um, just to like get all the shit out of your head. But I think the magic in that process for me, and they highly suggested it in the book, was not just journaling in a regular journal, was tearing the pages out of the journals because we have a tendency as humans to go back and ruminate over things, which sometimes is just like replaying stories in our heads over and over again, which doesn't actually usually end up serving us. It usually just ends up getting us stuck in another cycle and another story. And so, so what I would do is I had my note, I had my notebook and I, at the end of journaling every morning, I would tear them out and I would put them into an envelope. And I would put that away. So the envelope wasn't completely sealed. So if I needed to pull it back out again, I could, but it wasn't as easily for me just to go back and file through. So I really, and honestly, I never ended up going back and looking at all of those. What I did ceremonial, ceremonially when it was all done, I took all of my pages and took them out in my backyard and put them in a bowl and I burned them which I I should have known back then that I was a witch and I didn't, but (laughs) that should have been, that should have been a key that I was wanting to go burn things underneath the full moon back then. Um, But for, I think for, in regards to untapping the creative aspect, it, for me personally was, it was, was trying something new, something that I didn't think that I was good at, which was painting. Um, I, you know, I could say I could choreograph a dance routine for you. Give me some sheet music and I could, I can sight read some music for you, but to actually like put, um, to have someone read something that I had written or to actually to have something visual that someone could like see felt very vulnerable to me, felt extremely vulnerable to me. Um, and so Being it, what I did was I went and just wandered through Michael's and just found like colors that made me happy and sat down with a, um, with a, with some paint and an easel and a canvas. And, um, the hardest part is they talk about your inner critic of, of silencing the inner critic and the inner critic is in essence, it's just an aspect of the ego, right? The one who wants to judge us of what we have to put out there. And so of taking something that you would normally feel really self-conscious of and just do it anyway, just to see what came out of it was really healing. Um, I can't necessarily tell you anything really profound or even give really give advice to one who's wanting to have this experience, except just go get the book and, and follow the path and the journey for yourself. But for me, what I found was, is I would turn my painting time because that was the main, that was the main art that I chose to express during my artist dates, mainly because it was so unfamiliar to me. And the unfamiliarity allowed me to fall into a meditation really easy because I was just had on some music and just put paint to the canvas and just let the color come out. Um, I really, really wanted to control the expect, wanted to control it, wanted to make it pretty. And so it was just an interesting thing of watching your thoughts, right. As far as the meditation of watching how I judged myself when I did it. Um, but for me, more than anything, it was a stepping stone to reducing some fear to be seen and to be heard. Because, because a big part of the book of sex, drugs, and yoga, a modern witch remembering herself is 
that we're often looking for a pathway outside of ourselves, that we're often looking for a roadmap that tells us if we do X, Y, and Z, that we'll get there. And so like to, like to choose to, to go in this other direction, just because it feels good and feels right can feel fucking scary. And so for me, and that's what the big message of the book is, is that I've, I've always constantly been looking for a roadmap outside myself to tell me which direction to go. Because if I do these steps, X, Y, and Z, I'll attain enlightenment. I'll attain inner peace. I'll, I'll be able to quit running from crazy. Like I've been my whole life because m- mental illness runs in my family. Like I I've always been looking for that external guidance and and tapping into my creative essence was a stepping stone of realizing that I can be the creator of my own reality instead of always choosing to step into somebody else's creation. There's a lot there that is really important to understand and fully think through for ourselves because we say that that inner critic is an element of ego, but psychologically, I prefer to even differentiate it as such and call it the super ego, like a lot of good writers before me have explained, because this is the thing that attempts to supersede and override the ego. Because the ego is your individualized, authentic, unique, local to this timeline and life experience. That's yourself, right? That's the, the real root of the ego. So what's truly going on is something's overshadowing that. And it's the mental image that we project of what others think of ourselves. So it's essentially like there's two competing images of yourself happening internally when the superego is overly powerful. It's not like you have the ability to ever banish it and get rid of it. It's an important thing because it actually is representing your empathy. But the problem is it's empathy wholly turned inside out and directed only at the outside. And that's why it becomes the harsh critic and judge because you'll never be what you see on the outside because each expression that another person has and every skill that another person has and actually set of multiple skills put together creates a unique artist. So it's great to learn from other people. And even if you're feeling stuck in your artistic practice of choice, it's never a bad idea to take on some tutorials or something because that's still receptive and activating the right brain. And it's very powerful to dedicate yourself to spending 15 or 30 minutes learning in this age of information where ignorance of anything is really a choice, not a necessity. And so turning the empathy back inwards and feeling how we feel about something without that inner critic, it's typically not going to be so harsh. But if it is, it represents a a deeper wounding that we need to heal, which is for some reason, perhaps there's something in our past that has given us the belief that um, regardless of what other people think, you're not good enough for you. And I've seen this happen as well. And that's a hard seed to pull out because the person will be very resistant to taking that away it represents type of armoring or shell that uh, sort of gives them an excuse not to take full responsibility of their reality which ultimately is always the the thing that's being rejected the realization and truth that you do generate everything through your primarily through your imagination so on the upside fighting that battle and uh, defeating the super ego, if you will, or at least putting it in its place and going and realizing it's not your job to be the same type of perfection that another being is, then uh, that does open up the creative flow. You do have a wider channel for imagination and the more improbable things that you begin to do and create because everything you create is unique and therefore highly improbable that it would even exist then the more other improbable things you draw to yourself. That's a long way of saying that even starting this show would never have happened if I hadn't started just getting back into drawing and realizing like you did the healing power of art and kind of in my own way, taking that, taking steps on that journey, like the book describes just from my own, um, I guess meditation led me there. So to realize that not creating was what was hurting me the most in my life when I was in my early twenties. And yeah, that's even why I do this show now is to hopefully 
shine light on that for as many people as possible, even if they only listen to one episode and then they're like ready to go after that and they don't need more inspiration. I'm, I'm happy if we can just share that around as much as possible. Absolutely. You know, giving ourselves permission to find our own creative expression is, is such, is such a huge gift that we can give ourselves and not only ourselves, but everybody else around us, because whether or not people truly value or appreciate our art doesn't matter. What matters is the level of presence that we bring to the people around us. So if doing our creative aspects bring us a heightened level of presence and joy and empathy and sensitivity, and we're able to bring that, that amplified level of presence into our relationships, then everybody else is blessed within our presence simultaneously. Um, and, and, you know, for me, chance, in regards to all of this, it was, it was really giving myself the permission to, to explore all different forms of healing and roadmaps. Um, because like you said, getting a tutorial and so on is great, but like for, say for example, why I said that the book, I was just giving me time to figure out the next stepping stone is, you know, uh, maybe I'll uh, yeah, I'm a Yogi fairy, witch is what I would call myself. And the, why I say that is, is because I never felt, I've never, a part of my pain body, I guess you could say, but I've always felt like I wasn't a good enough yogi. I eat meat. I drink alcohol. I, I do a lot of the things that are, are considered a no-no by all of the yogis. And so there were all of these different groups of people in which I got really inspired by and found lots of healings from that um, that I loved, but then I, I didn't feel like I ever, like I could ever get to that place where I felt good enough that it's like, well, damn it. I'm hanging out with all of my yogi friends, but I fucking want a hamburger. I, I know that's horrible to say, but you know, I, I would find myself always shaming myself for not living up to the standard of the roadmap in which was really helpful to me. And so, um, and, and so I think it's really detrimental to the psyche to feel that one path is right for everybody. And not only just that, maybe not, maybe, maybe, maybe you, I, as an individual can take this practice from this discipline, this practice from this discipline, this wisdom from this group of people. And I can actually develop a spirituality of my own that works for me. That's a roadmap based on my, who I am as a human, not of what this has been as a collective, not saying that tapping into the collective isn't re really helpful. Um, I'm just looking for a way to help women right now be, feel more whole and more confident and quit comparing themselves to others around them. So we can, so we can am amplify the level of presence and joy within our homes. I definitely advocate that as well. However, there is always such a thing as, I guess, absolute truth. But when it comes to what's right for a person in a particular moment, then there's a lot of things that might be right more than other things. So what I'm getting at is that while we can find the reason we can find kernels of wisdom that are highly applicable and healing in all kinds of various spiritual traditions is because everything mainstream or even that we find that comes down from afar at all that's spiritual are fragments of a unified philosophy that used to exist. And the reason why there would have been one unified philosophy, just like you can track the word witch back to a uh, Vedic word that that's, and that all connects back to Egypt. The, uh, the Vedic system is very similar to the Egyptian system is very similar to the Celtic Druidic systems and all seeds off the same tree, which means at the end of the day, there is going to be benefit to um, every level of purification 
of yourself that you can achieve. Uh, but there's no, there's no wisdom or benefit in the shaming of yourself uh, for what you haven't achieved yet. Like you're saying, and exactly. the, when we heal that shame, we become more comfortable with ourselves as we are. And we become less desirous of things that we feel like we would be less without or that we can't do without. And this is kind of like, this isn't coming at you and saying like, Oh, you should definitely stop eating meat just because that's something that I've integrated and assimilated. Uh, it might be a path for you at some point. It might be a step for you, but you know, I, that doesn't mean just because I've done that, that there aren't things that I do that you would never do that are harmful to me in a certain way, or overall, not the most purified form of behavior or the most self-aware form of behavior. Does that make sense? We, we are, we're all at a different point of uh, putting the puzzle together of being whole, if you will. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I, my intuition is telling me we're probably getting close on time, but we could, I haven't looked at a clock for a little bit, but there's a little story that. Good female intuition. We just passed the hour mark as you said that. <laughs> Did we? Seems like a good point to uh, start wrapping up. We're close to, we got about five minutes left, but you've plenty of time to take the floor and finish your thoughts on this amazing plus extension and then uh, give us your plugs and websites and all that when we, we get there. So the name of my retreats are remembering your she power, a retreat for more passion, pleasure, and peace. And I, I say this, remember your she power because Many, uh, for many of us, it takes a remembering. For many of us ex as women, it takes a remembering of who we are, is that we have been, con we've been raised in a society that tells us what to think, what to believe, how to dress, what's cool, what's not cool, what's okay, what's not okay. And the reality of it, a reality of our life experience is, is we were made in the image of our creator, to be creative beings, to be the creators, creatrixes of our own life and our own reality. And in doing that, we have to take radical fucking responsibility because it's really easy as women or any other demographic that has been subjugated or put down over the years. It's really easy to point fingers and to cast blame and to make excuses for all the reasons why we are in the life situation in which we are in. That said, I recently heard a teacher say, that we were chosen to be incarnated during this time because something greater than ourselves knew that our souls were needed during this time. And if we are going to help make a shift in from diversity or what is the uh, polarity and back into more of a union consciousness, a unity consciousness, it has, we have to let go of pointing fingers. And we have to remember that every situation is an opportunity to learn and grow. And if we allow ourselves to ask ourselves, how can I take all of the things that are going on around outside of me and use it as an opportunity to step into a better and more alive version of ourselves. We owe it to ourselves and we owe it to our relationships and knowing and doing are not synonymous. So it has to be a conscious choice on a daily basis to not hit the easy button and to actually look inward and see 
how can I, what, what am I supposed to be learning and how am I supposed to be growing in this situation? And, and how can I become more conscious? And so in regards to if your priority is to have a loving relationship with the partner that you chose, if your priority is to build a solid family union, unit, then it, ha it has very little to do with the partner that you chose. It has some to do with the partner you chose, but, you know, it, that, that's, a th that's kind of a, su a side subject. But it has, you know, it has very little to do with the person you chose and it has more to do with how you choose to show up and grow. Because every uncomfortable situation is an opportunity to go inward and to see how, how can I expand instead of contract? How can I become more flexible? How can I become more loving? And it, it takes us first learning about our bodies, whether it be our cyclical nature, whether it be how we find peace, how we find pleasure, how we find joy, and then showing up and doing those things. Because the more we show up in joy, in pleasure, in passion, in real rawness, the less we're placing blame on others and the more we can evolve as a species. So if you want to learn more about my story, if you want to learn more about the tools that I have acquired, you can either um, come to one of my retreats. You can go to aubreywarren.com forward slash she power, and you can find, find out more about my retreats, or you can go to my Patreon account, Aubrey Warren, your festival fairy godmother, and you can subscribe to the sex, drugs, and yoga, um, the sex, drugs, and yoga Patreon level, and you'll be able to read the book as I release it chapter by chapter, telling the stories and sharing the tools. And if you want to give a higher level of Patreon membership, I'll also give you uh, monthly meditations and yoga practices and that sort of stuff. So if you want to get more from me as a yogi or even a lifestyle coach, um, there's other Patreon levels for that. Really exciting to see you expanding into a more diverse level of your gifts to the planet. And I like how you said those four, those four traits that you gave all around that, uh, that ties into the four seasons again, those like bringing those four elements into our life and bringing f the fun and the flavor and the mystery back into our lives at the same time, instead of the monotone humdrum thing that's been going on. Our uniqueness is our unity. And if we don't find our unity through expressing our uniqueness, we find unity through assimilating to what others are doing. It's kind of like the difference between Agent Smith and Neo in the Matrix. So do we want a unity of Agent Smiths or do we want a unity of super messiahs? <laughs> and so, right, like I think that we know the answer. We all want to fly around. So thanks for uh, getting us kickstarted on this journey to being more aware of our personal cycles for both men and women. I think there's something to take away from this, especially the challenge you gave me to track my own personal moods and energy levels during the moon phases, which I think is something I'm long overdue for. So thanks for being the reflection that points the way towards something uh, that I'm ready to start taking action on instead of just the slacky poo uh, type of mentality I've had towards that until now and just riding the waves as they come instead of knowing which way the wind blows and preparing the sails because that's where free energy is at. You don't need a motor. <laughs> you don't need motivation. It just flows. Like this is all very cool. Um, I think we could go on for another hour if we're not careful. <laughs> I'll end with this then. A famous, a famous teacher within my lineage, Dion Yogi, says, grace is all around us, but you have to have your sail up. So if you, if you, if you know the direction you're flowing, you can have your sail going in the proper direction, and that's when you're going to catch the winds of grace. Man, this unlocked a lot of levels for me. This is great. Went into this conversation not knowing what to expect at all and just leaving it up to the mystery of the divine feminine and through you her embodied champion i was not disappointed <laughs> i learned much and made many connections to things that but i really connected a lot of separated ideas in my mind in this conversation and i thank you for it i will never look at 
a lot of things the same way again, especially in regards to our, our bodies and um, the earth and how those cycles really are part of the same frequency. So thank you for enlightening us. And especially in the plus extension where I had one of the most interesting plus extensions ever for me, uh, as far as how much I learned. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll definitely do this again. I'll let you know how the moon calendar goes. Everybody go check out Aubrey on her website, YouTube channel, Facebook, Instagram, show her some love. She deserves it. This is quite uh, a special person right here. And I'm glad to call you my friend and not just podcast guests. Me too, brother. Me too. Thank you for all you do. Sweet mother of creation. We have done it again, my friends. Completed a great chat with a wonderful soul. And I'm really appreciating Aubrey's perspectives on the various things we talked about and that she was willing to come back for a second time to give us some of that information that she will only be sharing at her paid workshops going forward. I guess you might end up getting some of it out of her book when that comes along. And maybe you can get more wisdom from her about managing our time cycles and our inner feminine because I think this applied to both men and women in a lot of ways, whether it's we're observing women externally or we're observing from the inside of one. <laughs> we both actually have both of the yin yang components in us. And I think that was my favorite element of the talk was how many places that we made that clear or clearer. <laughs> and plus, we went much deeper, of course. If you don't know about Interverse Plus, that's where you can subscribe to the show for five bucks a month and get double length episodes. And like I was saying, Aubrey actually provided us with some content that she would otherwise have made you come see her in person for. So thank you again for that. Some of the things we talked about transmuting negative emotions into fuel strategies for achieving balance with your hormone cycles and the time management teachings from her workshop presentation. So that stuff was really interesting. I learned a lot about how the hormone cycle really works and we were able to connect that to, you know, like the seasons and other occult matrix of four type, I guess, philosophies about the duality in polarity, <laughs> fun stuff and stuff we've talked about a while back, especially with a guest called uh, Ethan Indigo Smith. I definitely recommend looking him up in past episodes. If you're interested in looking deeper into how this yin yang dynamic applies to our whole universe, but other things we talked about in plus why negativity is not to be confused with evil. I think that ties in directly to looking at things from yin and yang, because that means that the the darkness or the black isn't really evil. It's just part of the component that makes the battery work. You got to have to positive and negative charge. And kind of like the way that we talked about with the word witch getting corrupted or co-opted negativity as a concept is conflated with yeah evil and, you know, unnecessary problems. So these deep dynamics of the yin and yang in men and women, we definitely got further into. And plus, I recommend it, including a little bit of talk at the end about how pharmaceutical birth control suppresses our abundance. And I may, may not have made that point as clear as I could. It's an idea that uh, I first was tipped off onto by Seven Bomar from SecretEnergy.com YouTube channel, Understanding. He's got a newer podcast. And I think like the first episode of it, he talked specifically about the occult side of birth control. And I think that's worth looking into because if we accept that the pharmaceutical companies are doing so much damage, which is kind of hard to ignore, we have to think, well, maybe this birth control thing isn't what it looks like either. But this is not like I'm judging you if you're on it. I'm just letting you know it's one more thing that you might want to consider not being on. Just like there's probably stuff I'm on that you shouldn't ever get on. <laughs> like uh, I'm, I'm on midnight waffles way too often need to chill out on that <laughs> sugar thing. <laughs> but one of the things Aubrey challenged me to do in this episode was pay attention to how I feel in the moon cycles. And uh, yeah, as I'm recording this, it's a new moon or it was a new moon last night. And 
it was interesting because if I hadn't been paying attention, I wouldn't have realized that there was a correlation here, but I had journaled that I'm having a difficult time motivating myself to be physically active, kind of heavy on escapism and wanting to distract myself with fun more than, you know, more than is balanced, uh, negative emotions and perspectives about other people's anger issues that are really my own anger issues, <laughs> believe it or not. But Part of what uh, the escapism cycle does for me personally is that it helps me not notice that I am angry about certain things and uh, keep that tamped down. And, you know, there is a blue flame of anger. There's things that are worth being kind of riled up about. And that was a big point in Aubrey's discussion with us today was that we can channel rage into a passion. But if I'm kind of ignoring how I feel about something and projecting my own inner anger on someone else and saying they're the angry one, which they might be reflecting anger because of course what you experience is what's inside you though. So anyway, hope that's making sense. Uh, but the, the moon phase journal has been cool for me. I wanted to let Aubrey know I'm looking at the moon phase and paying attention to at least like a few words about my mood that day and how it went. So um, looking forward to having more of that data about how my own cycles work. It's pretty cool. Also, well, there's a lot more I could say, but about this episode, I think it was fascinating, but I think I'll just kind of make my way towards the end and hope that we'll have Aubrey back again soon because there's so much more about this yin yang dynamic between men and women, like the way the penis and vagina and the testicles and ovaries are almost like the inverted versions of one another. They're like the same shape. The, any, anyway, there's all kinds of evidence that the yin yang thing is a perfect symbol for this particular dimension. But I wanted to tell you guys, as far as like show news, show updates, a couple things. Uh, first, I'm not going to be playing music at the end of shows anymore that often. I want to start doing it again to a degree. Uh, but the way I have been doing it, I've realized it's caused me problems. Specifically, things like Spotify are actually blocking you guys from getting some episodes of the show on Spotify because there's that music in there. And uh, YouTube, I don't want to get just randomly kicked off YouTube someday either from this. And I already technically have like strikes over it, even though I have made sure to go ask the person who owns the song or made the song, I should say, not who owns it. <laughs> I mean, they should own it, but sometimes a record company owns it and that's where these problems come in. You know, if it's just like a homies band, like a Cadella, for example, they never cause a problem like that. So unfortunately not all the music I've chosen has been that way. And you never know when the copyright crunch will get tighter and the squeeze will get more sinister so I'm just going to have to stop doing that. And maybe, who knows, that type of music use is also pushing me down in the algorithms for people getting served my content. I don't know. But overall, I'm going to chill out on that. I would like to see some original Interverse music make its way onto the show. That would be really cool. So if you make music and you want to possibly make music that I could use for the show, uh, bumper music at the intro. Oh, by the way, I shortened the intro because I think that also will help uh, everybody. <laughs> Don't need to sit through two minute intro at the beginning. 30 seconds is way better. So, um, But I would like to eventually replace that intro with new intro, maybe do that yearly. So if you make music, you have anything interverse inspired, you could send my way. I would even, you know, tip you for that. Uh, or if you wanted to work something out and you wanted to like sell me music that you create original for the show, send me an email, chance at interversepodcast.com. I want to start collecting it and then, I don't know, make a interverse album. No, <laughs> a compilation album. I guess that would be like a, something patrons could get actually. Now that I think about it, I can make those files available to patrons, all kinds of fun stuff. I just want to get that content, original audience created content so that I feel like there's a little bit of you guys involved in the show more than more than there is right now. So that's the uh, the big news. Also want to give a shout out to Taylor, who is uh, one of the, the biggest patrons on the whole Patreon subscription model right now supporting us. So thank you for continuing that support and 
you definitely deserve a shout out. Hope you're doing awesome. And I guess let's uh, remind you that there's t-shirts available on the Interverse website. If you go to the shop link at the top, so you can get Interverse t-shirt, support me that way and rep the show. You have a conversation starter. Like you ever heard of this podcast? It's pretty weird. Anyway. Yeah. Interversepodcast.com forward slash shop. Uh, there, there you go. That's all I got for you guys today. Hope that this is a beautiful one for you out there, whatever you find yourself doing. And that <laughs> maybe hope helped you out with this episode in some way in uh, figuring out that where you're at in a mood state is not necessarily all your fault or something you need to fully identify with. And the most important thing is to realize that if you are asking yourself how you feel and paying attention to that and tracking that and you're bringing the inside to the outside, then you're not being influenced from the outside to tell you how you, you feel. You're telling yourself how you feel. Does that make sense? It's all about looking inside to know how you feel. And then no matter what happens, it can't really affect you because you already know how you feel as opposed to looking for something in the outside to be like, this is the thing that dictates my mood because this happened. I'm happy or because this happened, I'm sad. And until then I'm just like, huh, you know, some neutral state, neutered state. I think that was maybe the greatest takeaway from this whole thing is that in any time you can bring your inside out instead of putting the outside in, it's probably better or more balanced based on the way that the flow goes around here. I mean, not so that you can't ever, you can't like never get something from the outside and integrate it and put it in. Of course, there's great teachers and teachings out there that you can do that with, but you can't be only on that. You need to balance it out. So start with the looking within part though. That's probably going to make you less triggerable. All right. Well, love you guys. I'm, I'm out of here. Talk to you next week. Got a really fun and wild episode coming up going back towards a little bit of conspiracy stuff but conspiracy facts not theories and some theories (laughs) all right well talk to you guys very soon love you peace